Okay, our next talk is how I extract caudal, mandibular, and maxillary molar teeth. And our speaker will be Dr. Mark Smith. So please help me welcome Dr. Smith. Thanks for coming back. I apologize for you folks having to sit on the floor and stand up. I um, apologize about the underestimation on the popularity of dentistry. <laughs> but we're going to get that message through one of these years, believe me. So I think the uh, M1 and M2 are tricky extractions in the dog. I don't, I don't like extracting these teeth. Even I, I don't like it. I'd rather have my residents and my partner do them. I try to, I try to fade off into the coffee pot when they are uh, talking about these teeth. But there are certainly indications for removing them. It's obviously easier, technically, if the fourth premolar is going at the same time, but often not, right? So, the most common reason for extraction is going to be periodontal disease. You can see that the M1 here has substantial periodontal disease uh, clinically when it was removed. And here you can see, the, um, in this case, the M2 had disease. So another value of x-rays. And in this case, the M1, we were able to keep it. But this is just a different tooth from a different patient. But taking x-rays is very important because many times we see pathology of these two teeth, particularly the M1 and M2 when they're not particularly mobile, but they'll have ra radiolucent areas around the roots. And people have seen that commonly, all right? Raise your hand, you all have seen that. So they have to go, and um, so we're gonna have to make a flap and, and make that happen. Also, it, they can be extracted, or a reason for extraction would be caries. caries. Caries are cavities, and they're bacterial in nature, so they're different than cavities related to quote-unquote tooth resorption, or quote-unquote cavities, probably. Tooth resorption used to be called cat cavities or kitty cavities, but we know it's a different pathophysiological disease. And so in this case, it's bacterial like in humans. And these caries are um, treatable. We can treat them as if it's a, a human cavity where we would remove the decay and put in a composite filling. So when you see a cavity, the main thing is to take an x-ray and see if we have evidence of endodontic disease. So in this case, we did, so we had to do an extraction. But if not, then you might want to refer for that tooth to be saved. I would always offer that to the owner, say, hey, we found a cavity during this routine cleaning. X-rays look like it might be a candidate for saving the tooth. Would you like to do that? And you'll be surprised by how many owners actually elect to try to save this tooth. Another indication for extraction. So the slides I'm going to show you are from a step-by-step -step procedure in the Journal of Dentary Dentistry in 2012 by Patrick Ball. Patrick's a diplomat in the college now. And they did a nice job. Some with his permission, presenting his um, extraction step by step. Someone asked me in the previous lecture, how can I get good step by step pictures of what you're talking about? And quite frankly, there really aren't any in textbooks. However, um, the Journal of Veterinary Dentistry has a compendium of all the step by steps that have ever been published. And all the extractions are in there. And so if you go to jvdonline.com, excuse me, online.org, jbdonline.org, you can order these compendiums, they're about $25 each, and you get great step-by-step -step procedures and, and things besides extractions. But the extractions are gonna be well worth the money, just having these extractions in a step-by-step -step format. So we're gonna start this procedure by making a flap. Now Patrick, he made a envelope flap, which means he's gonna elevate the gingiva and the mucosa beginning at the distal aspect of the fourth premolar. I kind of prefer to make a release incision right here, a release incision here. But he, um, in fact, he's going to make a release incision a little bit right here. So he did make a release incision eventually. But um, he's kind of making an envelope flap. And let's, let's think about that. I don't think he made a release incision. We'll talk about that as we go. But there's two options here. One is an envelope flap like this. We're actually elevating gingiva and mucosa. And then you're extending that flap elevation caudally. Another is to make a vertical incision here and make basically a triangular flap and reflect it caudally. Either way, you're trying to access those two last molar teeth. Now, as we talked about previously this morning, you can choose to section the tooth first or you can remove buccal bone first and then section the tooth, but either way, we have to section these teeth. So these teeth have three roots. They have two buccal roots, a mesial buccal root, which is um, to your right, 
and then a distal buccal root, which is to your left, and then a palatal root, which is going to be towards midline. So palatal root is the palatal crown. It's a cusp here for the distal buccal and a cusp there for the mesial buccal. And the same architecture and nomenclature for the second molar. So we're going to have to section both teeth into three pieces. And it's very important to show the owner on a model. We have these plastic acrylic models where I show the owners the, the number of roots these teeth have. They're always amazed. I say, see these three teeth, including the fourth premolar? They're like tripods, and they're very strong and tough to get out. Mother Nature did not want these teeth to come out. It's like getting out wisdom teeth. So I want to impress upon the owner that this is oral surgery, and it's a challenging surgery. It's not just like popping teeth out with a string and a doorknob, okay? So they have to understand what technique and what expertise it takes for these, this to happen and why the fee is going to be what it is. So again, looking at the model then, from the coronal aspect, we're going to make, excuse me, we're going to make our section here. We're going to section through. There's a little bit of a uh, trough right here between the palatal aspect and the two mesial cusps. So we're going to cut right here and separate the palatal aspect and then make a, another cut between the two distal, two cusps of the mesial, distal, excuse me, the mesial uh, buckle and the distal buckle. So a cut here, and then a cut here, like a cross or a T. Same thing on this tooth, a little bit of an angle here. Cut here, and then a cut between the cusps. Yeah, always, we always position our patients in dorsal recumbency. So we have a dorsal aspect here. <clears throat> so again, from the dorsal aspect, again, we're looking ventrally, from, the, from ventral or from coronal. I'm going to say coronal because we're talking about teeth. So you can see we made our cuts in the M1. Now we're making our cuts in the M2. So we're sectioning the teeth. And so we're sectioning based on the crown anatomy, not based on seeing any roots, but this is based on crown anatomy. And by the way, crown anatomy is very reliable. All those years in anatomy class, you know, that there, it does pay off in the end. So now we're going to start to take away buccal bone. We start by removing buccal bone along the um, mesial buccal root. So here's the mesial buccal root. We're using a round burr to take away buccal bone. We're trying to be careful not to damage the distal root of the fourth premolar. So in that space between the distal root of the fourth premolar and the first molar, I might use a quarter round burr or a smaller burr and stay right on that tooth root, which means we're really obliterating the periodontal space. And like we've talked about repeatedly today, by obliterating that periodontal space, Right, we're going to loosen that tooth because the periodontal ligament actually holds the tooth in the alveolus. If you could use some magical instrument and go around that tooth and only uh, obliterate the periodontal ligament, that tooth would come out very easily. Now, in this case, we can use a cross-cut burr and actually shave off part of the crown so that we can drop that burr down and actually establish a space between the fourth premolar and the um, <clears throat> the distal, me, mesodistal root right here, excuse me, the mesiobuccal root right here. So again, just like the M1 I talked about this morning, we can shave off part of that crown. What happens to that crown doesn't matter. That crown is leaving town, right? So we can manipulate the crown, we can mechanically make it to our advantage. So this maneuver, by shaving off some of the crown, is protecting the fourth premolar and allowing an access site for the periodontal elevator by shaving that off. Once that's been done and we've taken bone away from the buccal aspect and we've gone around this tooth, I'll also take the burr and I'll go around this tooth where I really can't see because I know that tooth goes straight down, that tooth root goes straight dorsally. So I know I can go around that tooth similar to the mesiopalatal root of the fourth premolar and establish, get a space here. And again, we're going to try to luxate that tooth in a lateral direction. So you can tell I'm moving this tooth because that space I made is closing. You don't see the gap there from the burr cut. So that tooth fragment's moving. And ultimately, I want to put the elevator here and try to push that tooth laterally, because I don't have much space distally or mesially because of these other tooth structures. You can use other instruments. You can use a luxator, different other extraction instruments. It doesn't really matter. Basically, you're just trying to elevate and move that tooth in a lateral direction. 
here we're delivering that crown root segment. You can see the apex is intact. You'll know if it fractured, you'll hear the crack. Won't be happy. Uh, you'll probably say a few bad words. But um, you want to definitely examine that tooth and make sure you see a feel and see a nice round apex. After that, we're going to move to the distal buckle root right here. And you can take, there's no reason why you can't take more bone away now. You don't have to go right for the elevator. I would take more bone right here, go around this aspect here with my burr, because by taking out the first root, the mesial buckle, we get more access to that other tooth root. And so you can take away more bone, so you have that burr in your hand. And then elevate. So now we remove both the buckle roots. You see the empty alveoli where those buccal roots used to be. Now the next step is remove the palatal root. I'll often just take a burr and go around the uh, palatal root crown because that root is a short, stumpy root and you can go around it blindly, really, with the burr. Don't go too deep. And then um, use an elevator and often even the extraction forceps are enough to rock that tooth root out. It's uh, fairly short and it rarely, rarely fractures, which is the good news. So here we're going around that tooth with a burr, trying to gain more access. And then you can see we're removing that tooth with a relatively short, stout root. So it's really hard to break that root, fracture that root. So at that point, we've completed extracting the M1. Now moving back, we do the same techniques to removing the M2. And you can see we've done our sectioning. And now we're going to remove buccal bone around the mesiobuccal root, using a small burr like this. We see we have one burr, like a number, looks like a number two. I mean, it looks like a, a number, a half, half round right here. And again, between the tooth roots, around tooth roots, because think about those roots going straight down into the bone, so you know anatomically you can go around them, almost like going around a pole in the ground, and you know that you're not gonna really gouge into the root. And again, we're gonna remove the roots sequentially, just like we did for the M1. By taking out the mesiobuccal root first, that allows access to the other three roots for more burr work, if you wish. So you can see we've um, taken out the mesiobuccal, now the distobuccal. And then finally, we're going to work on that um, palatal root. Now we're going to check all the roots, make sure they're all intact. And either way, we're going to take a post-op radiograph to confirm all the roots are out, no matter what. Here we're using a curette to remove any uh, debris or diseased tissue. We can trim away any um, tissue, any gingiva that has been traumatized during the extraction process. And then in this case, a diamond burr to do what we call osteoplasty. Osteoplasty to smooth the ragged, uh, rough edges of bone. Help mother nature out that's going to have to remodel that bone anyway. It's going to make the post-op radiograph look better. So at this point, we have the, um, Patrick did not do a release incision. So what you see here is that envelope flap, and then this is part of the flap right here that was along this area. So Patrick elevated this flap and is using dissecting iris scissors to undermine that flap tissue and basically release this tissue, undermine it, and mobilize it so that this point is going to be sutured to this point. And the gingiva, we want to wrap around the fourth premolar because whenever you close a flap that you've taken out a tooth and then you have adjacent teeth remaining, the most important part of your closure is to reestablish the gingival attachment to the remaining teeth. The space in between where that tooth had been doesn't matter that much. That's going to heal no matter what. But you want to really try to establish a gingival margin around the remaining teeth. So that's being done here. And then the wound closure. Anatomically, you always want to be careful because these tooth roots are going to be going up towards the orbit. And we have blood supply coming in, the maxillary artery coming in that feeds the infraorbital artery. So you can see, you don't want to go too deep in here because you can get hemorrhage. Here are the root apices here of, the three, of those three roots mesial roots, and the palatals right here. 
So be careful. You don't want to be diving in there with an elevator trying to find a root tip. Be very specific, be very gentle. This is a, a case where we had some tooth roots left behind. And we had to do surgery because the dog had hemorrhage and actually uh, was at an emergency clinic getting a transfusion. Because the veterinarian hit the artery that I just showed you. So we got the tooth roots out, put in some uh, gel foam because I was concerned about any ongoing hemorrhage. Did our wound closure. And I ligated the external carotid just to play it safe. Because I did not want that dog bleeding anymore from that side. And I didn't see any bleeding during the surgery, but we um, just want to make sure it was going to be OK. Now, the mandibular teeth are very similar in that we have these teeth we're going to be extracting, the M1, 2, and 3. M1 and 2 have double roots, but we're going to use the same principles, you know, sectioning, removing bone around the teeth. Again, periodontal disease, most common indication. Making a flap. Like Dr. Manfred, I showed you this morning in her step-by-step, -step, we're going to elevate the tissue. And again, if we do with the other teeth, we're going to make a longer flap. Elevate, section the tooth. Remove bone, about 50% of the distance. This is too much bone, that's too far down. That's about 100%, that's my young days. About 50% is better. Taking out multiple teeth in a row. Here, again, technique-wise, shaving some of the bones so we don't injure the adjoining teeth, adjacent teeth. Elevation. Debridement, flap closure like we discussed this morning. We have to release the periosteum and then the wound closure. So again, always take pre-op x-rays. You want to see how much damage and how much trauma and periosteal disease, periodontal disease there is before you start. And then we also put in a bone substitute or stimulating material when we're done. So here's before bone substitute. Here's after. So it looks like the roots are there, but that's really bone graft. And that pre-op film, just make sure you know what you're getting into before you start. Any questions I can answer? Yes. Yeah, that tooth I had really bad periodontal disease. You can see on the distal root, right here. I had bad periodontal disease. Might have had a perioendo lesion. That could be lysis. So that jaw was not unstable, right? So it's not fractured technically. And so it might have been fractured. You have a risk of fracturing and trying to get that tooth out. So we warned the owner about that first. But in fact, we got it out and the jaw was still stable. And the reason is we still had the lingual cortical plate on the lingual side. We still had some buccal bone left. And we may have had some fibrous tissue here, but basically we were able to get that tooth out without fracturing the mandible. Now, technically, it might have been quote unquote fractured, but it was stable. Any other questions? All right, we're going to move on to the next speaker, Dr. Charlier. We're going to rapid rover. Thank you. <clears throat>